Hey everybody, Yogi Philosopher here. And so for today, I'm going to give the second part of my two part lecture, uh, just kind of explaining the contents and significance of my first book. And uh, so as with the first part, uh, I'll put a link in the description for anyone who wants to buy the book and, and read it on your own time. Uh, but these lectures are just, you know, meant to give you a general sense of what I'm saying and why it matters. And so whereas the first lecture I gave was pretty much all about the former, of what I'm saying, this lecture is going to be about the contemporary significance of it. And so just to recap, uh, the first part of my lecture, or the first lecture was about the first part of my thesis, which is that Nietzsche's reading of the pre-Socratic philosophers as being primarily religious reformers uh, enables us to see that they were um, promoting or reviving a kind of goddess and rebirth-centered form of spirituality within the relatively, you know, and generally um, patriarchal and death glorifying culture of archaic Greece. And so today we're just going to talk about why this matters. And so the second part of my thesis, which speaks to this, is that uh, contemporary philosophers in general, and women philosophers in particular, can and should use this new perspective on the origin and hence the nature of philosophy um, to contribute to Nietzsche's vision as the philosopher as cultural position. That is for Nietzsche, and I agree, the role of the philosopher is to work towards cultural and spiritual healing. And so I argue that contemporary philosophers can do this by reconceiving of philosophy itself as a form of goddess worship, essentially, as a feminine form of religiosity, you know, pretty much returning philosophy back to what it was when it originated, you know, as a what we would today call a feminist religious reform movement. Um, and so this is a big part of what I mean when I talk about philosophy for global transformation. And so for me, that specifically translates into providing a spiritual foundation for democracy. That's pretty much where I'm, where I'm going with all this. And so in order to flesh out uh, how this all works, I'll begin by talking about the importance of philosophy for democracy, which I derive from an observation that John Dewey makes. And so for John Dewey, and this is a quote, uh, democracy is more than a form of government, end quote. Insofar as the essence of democracy doesn't consist in abstract rights, but in the collective decision-making process, in people's ability to work together, you know, to, to have new ideas, to think creatively and originally, to share those ideas, to listen to others' idea, other ideas, and to work together, you know. So pretty much basically, it doesn't matter how well orchestrated a system of democratic governance is without the cultural foundation. And so I pretty much take that observation by Dewey and just run with it and just say, yeah, the essence of democracy consists in philosophical discourse, in the general population's capacity for philosophical discourse. And we have to keep in mind that this is a skill. Creativity is a skill. Being open-minded, these are skills that need to be nurtured. Um, and uh, so, yeah, pretty much where I'm going here now is to kind of throw a monkey wrench into this. Like, it's not that simple. And one of the reasons why it isn't so simple is phil philosophical intelligence, as far as I'm concerned, it's not something that way one really has control over. So in my first uh, video on this channel, I spoke about philosophy being specifically a creative and self-reflective form of intelligence. You know, the ability to think of new ideas, which is a skill. You know, again, a lot of people are very unoriginal. Uh, and also the ability to reflect on presuppositions, which is, again, a skill. A lot of people are really incapable of reflecting on certain foundational assumptions that they have. Um, however, these events of um, inspiration, let's just say, of creative inspiration and self-reflection, there's no formula for them. There's no way to rationalize your way into it, just like you can't calculate your way into being a creative person. You can't calculate your way into being a self-reflective person. This is what Nietzsche means when he talks about philosophy as a pathos. So philosophy is less of a practice, something one does, and it's more of a pathos of something that happens to one. And the way I illustrate this is just from my experience as a writer. I can't tell you how many times I've spent an entire day writing and then it's only later, like when I'm doing something completely different, that I realize, like, oh, this is what I've been, what I should have been saying, or oh, here's a new insight or reflection on what I'm doing, and so this makes it a little tricky, 
you know, if philosophy or if um, democracy is grounded in philosophy and philosophy, philosophical intelligence is something that needs to be continually nurtured because it's not something that one can just turn on and turn off. How do we further promote the cultural foundations of philosophy? Obviously, for me, yoga is going to be a big part of it. That's what I spoke about in the first video. Um, and Nietzsche shows how we can use our bodies, you know, not just yoga, but like just generally being aware of our bodies, any kind of somatic practice, athletics, qigong, you know, any of these kind of things. Uh, Nietzsche shows how we can cultivate philosophy through the body because for him, philosophical concepts are really just the intellect's interpretation of bodily states. For him, the events of philosophical creativity and reflection come from the unconscious creativity and intelligence of the body. And his view has been supported by recent research in, in body cognition that really shows uh, that learning extends throughout the body. It's learning is not just in the brain. So like if you have a spinal cord trauma or injury, your spine can learn how to you know cope with that, learn how to adjust itself. Um, and so it's in this way that, you know, yoga and everything, these, you know, working with the body can, you know, help culture or cult, help cultivate the cultural foundations of democracy. However, things get a little bit more complicated, even so, um, because by recognizing that mind is extended throughout the body, research in body cognition and Nietzsche's work also show that the mind extends throughout society. This is what I mean by social cognition um, in, in this uh, lecture's title. And so where I'm going with this is, so it's in this way that not only does democracy depend on philosophy, philosophy depends on democracy. And we can further um, illustrate this by turning to Rihanna Eisler's cultural transformation theory. And so for Rihanna Eisler, um, underlying the various political systems that we see throughout human history is our species tendency to gravitate towards one of two um, social models. And each society is never one or the other. Each society is always an assemblage of these two tendencies. Um, but nevertheless, they are as follows. On the one hand, you have the partnership model of society, which, or in which communities are held together um, by mutual enjoyment, by mutual pleasure, by the kind of joy that we take from being part of a community. You know, it's very basic. Um, however, the dominator model of society is one in which communities are held together either by the use or the threat of violence. You know, the use of force, the use of you know violence. And so the main point here, just tying into what we were just talking about with social cognition, the main point here is that each of these social models encourages different neurochemical profiles, different ways of thinking. And, you know, long story short, the partnership, whereas the partnership model of society facilitates philosophical intelligence, the dominator model of society inhibits philosophical intelligence. You know, very basically, stress makes you stupid. And the constant stress in living in violent and domineering cultures is going to inhibit people's creative intelligence and really inhibit their self-reflection because they're kind of operating in just survival mode all the time. They don't have the kind of space and safety to let thoughts come and, and you know, to speculate. You know what I mean? Um, and so this really explains a, a dangerous feedback loop that we are in now in the 21st century as a species. Uh, so in my view, it's specifically the dangerous lack of philosophical intelligence in the general population, you know, people's inability to cooperate and listen to other views and work, you know, all the stuff that we talked about. It's the general lack of philosophical intelligence in the general population that is leading towards such political instability and the, the crises of the 21st century, you know, when our ability to even come together and make collective decisions is itself, you know, going away, things are getting really bad. And it's also this political instability and the stress of our times, which in turn is inhibiting philosophical intelligence. So we're in this negative or this, you know, really dismal kind of feedback loop. And so my answer to this is to show that the cultural foundations of democracy are not just philosophical, but feminine. And so as Rihanna Eisler notes, um, partnership societies tend to be more, they tend to value women more. You know, they tend to place more value on women. Uh, things associated with feminine, feminine activities, all that good stuff. Whereas dominator societies tend to be patriarchal and misogynistic. And so I equate democracy with partnership 
and domination with fascism, just as a very general, uh, you know, category, categories to, you know, kind of process what we're going through as a culture these days. And then I'm right to do so um, is indicated by several things. One is uh, in an article for The Guardian, Jason Wilson notes fascism is really just an exacerbation and a more militant expression of the kind of patriarchal uh, relationships between men and women that have been happening for centuries. And so in this way, um, you know, that's not to say that all patriarchy is fascism, but as the psychosexual lifeblood and foundation upon which fascism, you know, grows, patriarchy is not just another valid social model that we should accept because it's, you know, grandfathered in, you know. Um, it's rather a phase that we are moving through as a species. And the same thing, like for me, the same as with organized religion. It's really over. Like we need to really move past it and progress. And just building off, um, building off this, um, there's a book called The First Political Order by uh, Bowen, Lynn, and, uh, uh, excuse me, Hudson, Bowen, and Lynn. Um, and this book really demonstrates the way that the oppression of women just jeopardizes political and jeopardizes political stability for everyone. And so pretty much what I'm saying, and this is a major theme of my work and, and everything I'm doing, is that promoting positive attitudes towards women and improving the lives of women and girls, th this isn't just a women's issue. This is central to promoting and ensuring the cultural foundations of democracy. And where I go for, from that is that, you know, like many people, I think on the left and, and you know, I agree, the future needs to be feminine. You know, it has to. We have to shift to a more feminine model just as a species, as a culture, as, you know, I'm speaking of Western culture. Um, but for me, it's not enough that we shift to a more feminine model. We need to specifically go to a religious kind of feminine model of social organization and, you know, the kind of spiritual foundations for Western democracy. Um, and, that and that a religious fem feminism, really, or feminine form of religion can lead to the kind of global transformation that I'm talking about is that it already has done so. And so here, in order to explain why this is the case, I'm now going to return to a major argument for the first thesis of my book that, you know, pre-Socratic philosophy was this feminine religious reform movement um, that I saved until this lecture because it also really illustrates the contemporary relevance of what I'm doing. And so pretty much one of the basic strategies that I use in my account of explaining the origin of Western philosophy is to note that our understanding of the historical origin of philosophy really depends our, on our understanding of the individual emergence of philosophy. So how philosophical intelligence arises individually on the personal level, how we understand that is obviously going to influence our account of how philosophy arose uh, in a historical sense. Um, and so we can understand or appreciate the importance of feminine spirituality in establishing the societal and cultural um, foundations for the individual and hence the historical emergence of philosophy when we unpack another observation by Rihanna Eisler, namely that different personifications of the divine both reflect and further reinforce cultural norms and values. And so basically, persona whereas personifying the divine as a nurturing goddess both reflects partnership values and norms and social practices and culture, it also reinforces partnership values. And, you know, in contrast to that, portraying the divine as a violent man obviously both reflects dominator values and reinforces them. Um, so right off the bat, you can see how a goddess um, spirituality can cultivate the, you know, cultural foundations and the kind of peaceful kind of community that will enable, um, you know, philosophical intelligence to blossom. However, it's more complicated than that because just as male figures like Dionysus and Jesus can promote partnership values, goddess figures can also promote dominator values. And it's because of this that goddess worship does not necessarily translate into better living conditions for real, real women, you know. We're not talking about causation here, but we are talking about correlation because historically um, goddess imagery and goddess worship does tend to correlate to more value for women, women being more valued in society and, and better living conditions. And so the way that this ties into the birth of, of Western philosophy and the cultural significance um, 
is that so mothers who are less stressed, who have better lives, who are themselves taken care of and supported, are they tend to be better able at providing maternal care than mothers who are more stressed. You know, it's difficult to give if you're not being given to. You know, it's difficult to support others if you yourself are not being supported. And so basically, um, what I'm doing in a nutshell, or my argument, is that given what we know now about the importance of maternal care, and especially the importance of touch for childhood development and brain development especially, it makes sense that the first philosophers came from, or many of them, came from regions whose millennia-long goddess traditions would have provided the ideological and the cultural foundations for philosophical intelligence to bloom on an individual level and then a cultural level. Uh, in a great footnote to The Chalice and the Blade, Rihanna Eisler notes and lists you know, the pre-Socratic philosophers that came from uh, areas of the world with tra uh, millennia-long traditions of goddess worship. And so my book is essentially a big commentary, an extending commentary on the significance of that footnote. And so, um, but building off of that, it also makes sense, not only that goddess worship, you know, if goddess worship was so integral to the cultural foundations and the kind of peaceful social practices and kinds of sexuality and relationality that facilitate facilitates uh, philosophical intelligence, it also makes sense that the first philosophers would want to promote that, would want to revive that kind of culture. So again, if the, if the pre-Socratics were religious reformers, well, what were they doing? Well, this is what they were doing. They were trying to revive and promote the very kind of spirituality which itself promotes the flourishing of philosophical intelligence. And another key piece of evidence that needs to be taken in consideration is that we already know that Greeks, many Greeks of the Archaic Age were becoming very dissatisfied with the violent kind of death-oriented nature of many Greek myths and, and religion. And so just to kind of cap things off here, um, pretty much what I'm doing is, um, you know, the idea that philosophy is a way of life is itself a very ancient one, but it usually is spoken of in terms, from what I can tell, in terms of individual way of life. Like, this is my way of life, this is how I choose to live. But I'm show sure philosophy has always been a collective way of life, namely the partnership-oriented, women affirming, you know, lifestyle that not only was so integral to the emergence of Western philosophy and democracy, but it's specifically characterized by a particular kind of religion, namely a goddess-centered and rebirth-centered form of religion. And so pretty much in a nutshell, what I'm arguing here now is that if goddess spirituality played such a formative role in establishing you know, Western democracy and philosophy, which are so central to the global status quo now. You know, the global world order is the Western European American world order, you know, for better or for worse. And if goddess religion played such a formative role in getting us here, then, like I said, reconceiving philosophy as a form of feminine spirituality as, as what it was, you know, in the beginning, as a kind of feminist religious reform movement, reconceiving philosophy as this, has the potential to really affect the kind of global transformation that I'm you know, working towards, that a lot of people are working towards, that I'm trying to contribute to. And then it can do so, um, that, or that the time is right now for it to do so, is indicated by the spiritual but not religious movement. You know, people are really, really getting more and more, especially young people, getting fed up with the patriarchal dogmatism of organized religion. And the spiritual but religious but not religious movement has been described as one of the as the most significant spiritual trend of our day. And so from my perspective, it would be irresponsible not to meet the growing need for healthier forms of religion in a way that also promotes and improves democracy, you know, for everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much that's pretty much it. That's where I'm going here. However, there is a caveat to this, and this is where we're going to get into with the next book. Um, I do recognize, and I end the first book by saying, as attractive as this may be, as attractive of this kind of spirituality, again, goddess-centered, a goddess-centered form of spirituality that views philosophy specifically, but also just inquiry itself as a path of divinization, of becoming divine that unfolds over successive lifetimes. As attractive as this may be to the growing spirit, but spiritual but not religious movement, um, it's unlikely that philosophy will be able to compete with organized patriarchal religion 
unless it can offer some hope of an afterlife, you know? And that's what my second book does. The second book is t currently titled Psychedelic Immortality. And what I'll be doing there is not only making the definitive case for reincarnation. Uh, researchers who've looked into it, it's pretty much been acknowledged for years now that the evidence for reincarnation is overwhelming. Um, but an explanation has been lacking. And so my book not only makes the definitive case for reincarnation, explains how reincarnation works, explains specifically how the process of reincarnation is experienced within our lifetimes as events of philosophical inspiration, um, and will also explain how all of this knowledge has been and continues to be suppressed by religious, academic, and political institutions. And then finally, my next book is gonna talk about how we can and why we should use psychedelics to facilitate past life recollection and that doing so is going to help us more robustly address the crises of the 21st century. So, you know, it's a tall order and um, a big part of what I'm doing is, again, building off this idea of something that Aldous Huxley said in, you know, in the mid 20th century is that we need a global religious reformation, you know, trying to sequester religion and just make it kind of like, you know, oh, well, that's in the, the private sphere. You know, no, we can't run away from this anymore. We have to confront the evils of organized religion and improve religion, you know, not to get, a, get rid of organized religion, but to improve everything for everyone. And that's essentially what I'm doing. Um, and so, yeah, I hope this is interesting to you. Um, so feel free to like this video if you like it um, and subscribe to the channel. You know, you can follow me on you know, Facebook, Instagram, my website, all these, all these wonderful things. And please leave comments in the section, um, in the comment section, because that's going to help me think about and figure out where I want to go. The next couple of videos I'll do, it'll be on the second book. We'll dive more into what I just said. Um, and yeah, thank you so much.